But, you know, I, I have some fundamental uh, ponderings, if you will, related to your um, nanowire technology. Uh, you know, first, why nanowires? Why not some <laughs> other form, right? Silicon has a lot of different ways it could be implemented in an anode, but you chose the nanowire. Well, why is that best? Yeah. You know, that's also something I asked myself 10 years ago before deciding to invest. And... Um, so let's first start with what has been known for about 20 years about silicon and lithium ion batteries. Uh, the, the first thing is that everybody knows for 20 years that you can store more lithium in silicon per gram of silicon than you can do in graphite, about nine or 10 times more. But everybody has known for a very long time that when you alloy lithium and silicon, the silicon blows up the volume expands. Yes. And then when you release the lithium, it contracts. And those variation in volume are much greater, uh, maybe 300% variations uh, between uncharged and charged uh, or alloyed silicon than it is for graphite. And so that has been a big problem that everybody has known. And what was discovered is that when you blow up the silicon by uh, essentially injecting lithium and electron, uh, if the particle is too large, it will break. I see. But if the particle is below 100 nanometers, which is very, very small, a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meter. So it's about, you know, uh, it's, it's about 20 thousands of a, the diameter of an of a eyelash. Uh, if, you, if you do the powder so small, then it will not crack. It, it can allow with the lithium in a way where the mechanical stress that is created is released because more and more, when you shrink the size, more and more silicon atoms are close to the surface. And comparatively, the ratio of silicon atoms in the core of the particle is a smaller and smaller ratio. So that has been known. And then you say, well, that's easy then. Let's just grind the damn thing and have a very fine powder and that's it. That's right. Well, then people discover another problem. And the other problem is that the surface area of a powder that is nanoscale powder of silicon is way higher. So if you take a micron-sized powder of silicon and you grind it to make a powder that is, let's say, 100 nanometer particles, the surface area will multiply by 10 to something like 40, 50, 60 square meter per gram. And then you run into another problem. And that other problem is that when you put that in a battery and during the first few days of what's called formation, you very slowly charge the battery and discharge the battery to create this fine pellicle that sits on top of the active material called SCI, Solid, solid Electrolyte Interface. Well, what, what happened is that there is just too much surface area. So you consume a lot of electrolyte that decompose against the very electrochemically active silicon area. So then people say, well, that's easy to solve. Now I'm going to basically add a carbon coat, uh, the silicon, or put the silicon inside the pores of something that are going to seal off so that there is no electrolyte contact with the silicon. And that's what people have been doing. And we did that about 15 years ago. And then you run into other problems that have to do with the ionic conductivity to get into the silicon and so on and so forth. Nanowires are fundamentally different. And they're fundamentally different for three basic reasons. The first reason is that the way you grow nanowar is by using a catalyst. And by using a catalyst, you can control the diameter of the nanowire. And the catalyst we use is extremely small. It's about 26 nanometers in diameter. So 26 nanometers is about 10 times the diameter of your DNA. In, you know, that's very small. And, and when you make something that is that small in diameter, but very long, for example, one or two micron, it's like a very, very thin eyelash or a very thin hair, and therefore it's called one-dimensional, and that's the name of the company, 1D. A couple of things happen, and this is basically quantum physics. The first part is that you don't have to worry about how quickly you're going to decompose the saline gas 
that is used to make the nanowires because a catalyst will make that reaction happen very fast with almost no waste and at very low cost. But at the same time, you will end up with all of the little hair of silicon having two properties. One is they all have more or less the same diameter, so you don't have to worry about the size of the silicon. And number two, the roots of the silicon are embedded into the graphene of the graphite, and that makes a perfect electrical contact. So now you have solved the first problem, which is how to control the the, the shape and the size of the silicon. Now, the second uh, aspect that is totally unique, and I'm going to describe it to you, is that the surface area of nanowires for the same amount of silicon is two orders of magnitude smaller than the surface area of a collection of nanoparticles of silicon. And, and that means that the electrolyte problem goes away. And I'm going to explain that in a very simple way. If you have a long, thin spaghetti, the surface area is that of the end point of the spaghetti on each side. And then the cylindrical shape of the spaghetti is basically the circumference times the length. Now, that has a surf- certain volume and a certain surface area. And imagine that it's made of silicon, not, you know, pasta, basically. And now you break that spaghetti in two and you add the surface at the middle on each side of the break point, but you have not changed the volume. And then you break it in four and then in eight and then in 16 and 32 until you end up with a collection of little particles that have all the same diameter as the diameter of the nanowires or in this case, a spaghetti you started with. And what you have is that you have a much larger surface area. So that's the second reason why it's unique. I see. And then the third reason that is unique is think about a light bulb that you're trying to light on your nightstand next to your bed. What are you going to do to light that light bulb? You're going to use an extension cord that on one end is connected to the light bulb and on the other end is connected into the outlet in the wall. And what you're trying to do is the most efficient way to get the electrons to go from the wall to the light bulb. Think now about charging a battery. What you're doing when you plug the plug at the charging station into your car is that you're injecting electrons. And billions and trillions of electrons find their way into the anode. And they basically, each of them has to match with a lithium ion and they have to marry each other inside the silicon. So you need to feed the silicon with electrons. And what better ways to do that to provide the electrons an extension cord made of silicon that is plugged into the graphite. And so the mobility after you have first charged the, you know, the, the battery, the, the silicon becomes doped with lithium ion. And doping is a, a term in, in electronics to say that it changes the mobility of electrons. So the electrons that you're injecting into your battery can move extremely quickly in the silicon along the length of the nanowires. And the lithium ion can penetrate from the side along the radius. And they have a very, very, very short distance to travel. And then the electron and lithium ion marry each other, which means that with nanowires, you can charge four and a half times faster than with graphite. And that speed relates to um, C rate. It's power, right? That's correct. Yeah, good. So we like power. Um, good. Very detailed explanation. Thank you for that. And you covered a couple of my next topics with that detailed explanation. So I won't have to go through that now. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the expansion has been a long-term problem, and you've kind of explained how that's uh, been solved. So that's really good news. Um, we covered how it also translates into higher C rates. Um, but um, what about the dry electrode coating? You know, how, how does that play into this? Is this one of the innovations you described that we need to develop further to keep our competitive advantage on the right side? Yeah, actually, this is a very good example of, a, of an invention that can dramatically increase performance of EV cells and decrease manufacturing cost. 
And so that's a perfect example. And it's something that, you know, our CTO started working more than 10 years ago. As a matter of fact, one of the patterns we have is co-inventor with a person that now works at Tesla because that person was on our patent, then worked for Maxwell, and then Tesla acquired Maxwell. But, but fundamentally, why is dry electrode coding both good and hard? It's good because you eliminate the mixing of the various ingredients that goes into the anode into a solvent, which you have to evaporate. And mixing in the solvent and then evaporation later is actually costing a lot of energy. And, uh, and therefore, if you can avoid that, uh, it's good. Why is it hard? Well, one of the, the properties of, a, of, of mixing is that you're trying to get to something that is homogeneous. Just think about making crepes at home where you have to mix you know, the flour and, and, and the milk and so on, and you're trying to not have any bubbles and not have any clumps so that you have a perfectly um, a wonderfully tasting crepe. Well, mixing the slurry in large EV cell factory is a really, really hard problem. Even when you do it with a solvent like water-based solvent for the anode, because in a 30 gigawatt hour EV cell factory, if you had a production manager, you will receive every day a train load of graphite that is equal in weight to twice the weight of a 747. And in the following 24 hours, you have to mix this graphite with the binders and the solvent and make it a fluid that is extremely uniform and then coat it on the uh, copper foil at about one meter per second and a uh, hundred mic- micron thick plus and minus one percent, perfectly uniform with no imperfection. That's difficult. Now imagine you get rid of the solvent. Now you have to mix stuff in solid state, you have different powders, and you don't have the benefit of the viscosity of the fluid or the solvent. And achieving uniformity is very hard. So if you have one type of, of let's say, powder, let's say it's graphite, and a, a few percentage points of binder powders, then you can easily do that. And that's what Tesla is doing today in producing a graphite only dry coated anode for the 4680 cells. But now imagine somebody comes along and say, you know, why don't you put a powder of a silicon additive and you dry mixing that? And then you're going to do dry coating those electrodes. Well, here is the problem. We just talk about the fact that the silicon can absorb a lot more lithium. So when you make a dry coated anode electrode and you have mixed the graphite and the silicon additive powder, it's very easy to have slight uniformities. So this square inch of the electrode has a little bit more silicon and that square inch has a little bit less silicon. And remember in the batteries, in the battery pack of an EV, you have 800 square meters of separator. That means you have the anode and the cathode facing each other over a very large area. And you know that in order to avoid problems, safety problems, you need to match the capacity of the cathode and the capacity of the anode. Now, if you cannot do that precisely enough, you will have run safety problems. Okay? And so achieving this uniformity of the silicon inside the graphite anode layers is very hard. Now, we solved that problem in a very elegant way, and we're the only one in the world doing that. We patented that by fusing the silicon nanowires to the graphite. So it's, each graphite particles may have 50,000, 100,000 nanowires on it. They mechanically attach. And so you don't have any mixing of an additive of silicon with the graphite. It's already pre-mixed, if you wish, in pre-mixed where it's uniform <clears throat> at the pure particle level. So and so now... The, yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. You solve the, the silicon distribution problem, but there's yeah. still the other, the other bits, right? You've got maybe some synthetic graphite or coatings, and those yeah, are still so there, they, right? Yeah, so there is another problem that exists is that in order to make this self-standing film, you have to use different binders that you use in a normal wet coating. One example of such binder is PTFE, which is Teflon. And PTFE, when you compress it between rollers, create little fibrils 
that act like the fabric that makes the self-standing film uh, self-standing, basically. And then you can press that onto the copper foil. Well, Teflon is not easy to stick to. And so whatever other things you're doing, you have to find a way that during the dry electrode coating, when you take the mixed powder that is dry mixed and you push it in between rollers to make this very thin pancake, you need a way to create an adhesion between the particles that is very, very good. And our CTO, Yimin Ju, invented a different type that doesn't exist in anywhere else of surface treatment. So the Cynanode product we produce has a very, very thin layer that is very unique, about two nanometers thick, that covers both the silicon and the graphite and really helps in developing those self-standing film. So that tells you that there is a lot of work that has gone on over the last 10 years to not only address the silicon issues, but the manufacturing issues as well. 